Kathleen Newman is the art hero every little girl should hear about. She completely mastered pastel and oil painting and won awards for it and made a successful career out of her passion. Kathleen is a living impersonation of what it was to pursue art as a woman in a time where a career in the industry was pretty close to impossible. Especially with no means to afford an education in the best art schools. You can find more of her work at KathleenNewman.com, but for now, please join us as we talk about how to get your work into galleries, mastering various art mediums without art school, the practice and benefits of meditative mindfulness, and the truth behind the 10,000 hour rule. Hi, I'm Anya, and this is Make More Art, a podcast by Etra meant to inspire you to keep on creating. Now let's hear from our guest. Okay, Kathleen, please take us all the way back. When did you realize that you wanted to do art for a living? I'll just start out saying I've been an artist my whole life and my mother was a big influence and took uh, an art class when we were little kids, so I got a sketchbook. And so I always loved to draw and I kept drawing and out of my, all my siblings, which there were four of us, I just stayed with it. So I look back and think just by never stopping, I ended up wow. still continuing to be an artist. And then I was lucky um, in our neighborhood, there was a, a, a guy who lived a couple houses away and he was a professional artist. So I started out in commercial art. Okay. So I was aware that there was a way to make a living as an artist. I never thought of being a fine artist. So as someone who always liked drawing, and I took art classes in high school, um, I had a teacher that took me to the Art Institute of Chicago, which is a really beautiful school, but in my background, um, financially, that was not going to be a possibility to go to the Art Institute. So I had to figure out a way to make a living as an artist, and I saw that a neighbor was doing that. He was working for an advertising agency as a designer, and he used to give me his layout pads and some extra supplies. and so. That's, I think, when I had the first inkling that it was possible to be an artist. How uh, old just, were you? Um, I would be in high school when I okay. actually could see that there was a job opportunity in the direction of being an artist. And that you just had to know how to draw because he would do quick sketches. So then from there, after um, high school, um, I still had to make a living. Like I, my parents were not sending me to college. Uh, I worked for one. Actually, I worked for one summer in an office because I could also type really fast, and that's oh. when that's when I knew I am not going to work in an office my whole life because oh I just couldn't be in that environment. And I was sitting in a park with a friend of mine, and we were thinking about our futures. And it dawned on me that someone is going to be an artist, and why not me? Like someone's going to do it. So, wow. and sometimes I don't even know where that little thought came from because it changed the course. So then I went to um, back to my community college, which is what I could afford, and I started mm -hmm. taking advertising art classes. And then I would always supplement. I took some weekend classes at the American Academy of Art in Chicago. So we were really lucky. American Academy of Art was a school that would help you develop a portfolio. They would take you directly to advertising um, opportunities and graphic design, which was so I became a marker renderer. And I would just draw and fill in with markers for TV storyboards, oh. logo design, and a layout for page um, pages in magazines. Like someone, like for a company, you have to do an ad for a magazine. So it's editorial design. And I just developed a portfolio, started knocking on doors, and then I did get a job um, full time for an ad agency. And I just worked in their art department. But that's where I really got to see the potential of just drawing well, that you draw and then markers was, were the medium. In the old days, it used to be pastel, but when they invented magic mark, now this is going way back, right, because I'm so uh, experienced, but um, you would just draw in um, marker and then fill in with magic marker colors, layout paper, and you did a lot of work really quickly, and so you developed your drawing skills very quickly, so I basically learned on the job wow. as far as drawing and how long were you there so I was there um let's see till I was 20 probably two years I was two years in that ad agency where I really had my eyes opened up to what an art director mm -hmm. does so then I started doing art direction but I was freelancing um and I worked for some people off and on 
and I learned from the people I worked with and the, like there'd be like a studio room. Uh, I also at one, that time working for an ad agency, I would hire illustrators to do the job. So here's the layout, but now we need a real artist, an illustrator to oh. do the actual illustration for this. And that's when I saw, oh, that's even better. I need to get into illustration. So on one hand, the graphic design or art directors, it all gets thrown away. But when I saw what the illustrators do, then I went back to school again, taking night classes and learning how to. Um, wow, how old were you then? So this is my early 20s, uh, 20, wow. 21, 22. I feel very lucky that I was able to see that world because nobody really, except for the neighbor that showed me it was there, but it was always a step by step. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wasn't going to university because we didn't financially have access. Though I look back, I could have figured out a way to borrow money, but in my family, nobody really went to college. So I kind of found my way step by step and um, through the different people I met, some really great artists who were on staff. It was fun. It was really fun too, working in an art department. So. I missed college, but I was having fun with people my age in an ad agency where, you know, people are really laid back and it was enjoyable. So um, I kept doing that and then freelancing. I started my own business, Queen of Arts Studio, and then I would do freelance work and I'd work at home, work a lot of hours at night, especially for the storyboard work, which is something that give you, you know, 30 uh, four by eights that needed to be done by tomorrow. First you do the pencils, then you do the finish and uh, for the commercials. So again, all this practice, all this linear practice, drawing by line and filling in with marker. Uh, so this, I don't want to um, lose my track, but what I think is really interesting in my background to where I am now, mm -hmm. which um, is that the linear drawing is like the urban sketchers. Okay. And the painter is more shape-based thinking. And I feel so lucky when the urban sketcher movement showed up, you know, recently after the plein air movement, they kind of tie together mm -hmm. both sides of my background. And so I like doing all of it, but, you know, drawing by line and uh, also shape-based painting in pastel and oils. So, and I know you want to stop the recording, but I feel like I'm moving on too no. many you want. No, no, this is great. This is great. Okay. Continue. This is really good. I'm just at all with your story so oh. far I had no idea seriously okay so that was um I was really enjoying having a good time um uh, learning and drawing a lot mm -hmm. and then uh when I was 23 I got married that's when I was doing the freelance work and then um let's see 1984 is when my daughter was born oh. so I took a hiatus from my queen of art studio uh freelance marker rendering design work. Uh, my, I, did, I did a lot of logos, I love logo design, and then mostly the TV storyboards was where I was at. And I could still freelance with my daughter, but it got to be harder and harder as she Freelance grew up. with your daughter? What do you mean, what? is she also pursuing arts? No, no, back when she was a baby. Oh, okay, sorry. I would take her with me, pick up jobs, and you go home and work. So like today, these things are possible, but I didn't need a, an office, I could work at home at night, and then I'd take my daughter with me, pick up jobs, come back, and I'm a night owl. That was also a benefit. Oh, oh okay, because I'm like, I just had a baby, and I could not do that. I, I am an early riser, thankfully, the babies as well. So it's like working during night while being sleep deprived with a baby. It's something else. Wow, you're, it will you're a queen. Well, it will change. So my daughter slept through the night at five weeks. 10 weeks, sorry, 10 weeks. At 10 weeks, she would sleep through the night, my son, three years later, was 10 months. So it's the baby. She helped me out. She would go to sleep. My husband would help too at night. But I basically lived two lives. I was home wow. all day. And then I would uh, work at night till, like the nights were endless. I'd hear the birds. I'd like, oh, I have to go to bed, the birds, you know. But I, I Oh, could my wait. goodness. <laughs> uh, if, if you are listening to this in our Apple podcast or audio only platform, you should go to YouTube and see my perplexed face because I'm... <laughs> I have a three, not, not, he's not three months yet, but not even once he slept through the night, but he's an actual calm baby. So he gives me like three, four, five hours of sleep every night. Like, you know, five hours, then three, then four, something like that. But you're saying that your kids are sleeping through the night and then you oh, the go one. to bed with the birds. So my girl was 
she literally slept. She was so easy. They both were easy, but my I kind of took that for granted because then on number two, he, three years later, it was 10 months before he would sleep through the night. Okay. But, you know, my husband might get up or, um, and I think I was doing, yeah, I was doing different work by the time my son was born. Okay. I didn't want to let it go. I didn't want to let go of my work or some of my clients because I felt if I did, I was going to lose the practice because you have to maintain your practice. Yes. And I felt so lucky that I already was successful. I know so many people get into art later and it's hard to get started later because mm -hmm. you have all this other stuff you need to do instead. But I, I was fortunate to already have been an artist and I didn't want to let that go. So I would really protect that. And um, my husband got involved because I asked him to help and he would. Um, but if you're just taking art as a hobby, it's hard to justify that you need that time. So I think that was to my benefit that I just had that confidence already that I was productive and I could make a living. But now the switch was, can I just paint for fun and not make the oh. living? So in 1984, when uh, Photoshop and Illustrator shows up on mm -hmm. the work scene, people aren't, um, it was a good time to take a break. Um, they weren't, they were going into computers and I had no interest in working on a computer. I was mm -hmm. definitely hands-on marker drawing on my hands. I couldn't imagine working with a mouse and having any feeling of, yeah, very you know, creativity. Um, so I was working in markers and, and painting or uh, markers and uh, drawing. Um, so then I took, then I stayed home full time, gave up my work mm -hmm. uh, and started going to the Art Institute of Chicago on Sundays. And you gave pictures. up all of your paid work? Well, it was dwindling down. I mean, I would manage. I wasn't working full time. I was oh. I was doing freelance. So I'd get a job and then I wouldn't get a job. Okay. But the jobs would, you know, like uh, it was very lucrative working in storyboard. You make a lot of money, crash and burn. Mm -hmm. You work for three nights, no sleep, and then you wouldn't work for a while. Then you get another job like that. Oh, I mean, yeah, I, the curse I, of the freelancer. Feast yeah, and famine. I, Right. I had to pace it so it was manageable. It wasn't full time anymore. But um, uh, I went back to school to take like life drawing and um, more fine art, which is something I'd always wanted to do. I just couldn't see how to get there. It was like someday I'll be a uh, fine artist. But um, let's see how, this, how to express this. So I started doing drawings from life drawings and uh, I found pastel. Mm -hmm. Uh, which immediate affinity for pastel because as a drawer it's drawing color and I felt like this is just heaven so I got into painting and pastel and started thinking differently like shape-based thinking yeah think value I never thought about value before so it goes all the way back to a basic art you know instruction um and how my kids, old were you this time 20 like, I was 29 when I had my daughter, so now I'm like 31, 32. And you're um, learning pastel from scratch, doing new classes. Right. This is amazing. Right. You're amazing. Well, just to keep up, because I, you know, it's yeah. like exercise. And I, I think it was a fear factor. I can already draw really well. Now what am I going to do with it? So I took classes, and that was fun, and started taking workshops to travel. Like I'd go for a week. Mm -hmm. I said Albert Handel in uh, Santa Fe with pastel instructor and my husband would be home with my kids and I always planned it when school was in session as they're growing up because uh, he was working and um, again I felt fortunate I would meet other students who were, were my age now <laughs> just mm -hmm. start into art and I was younger and they all told me you're so lucky or you're so smart to be doing this now and I I had such a great start I was just going to stay within my groove I didn't want to let that go so very lucky to have found it and continued on. But then I got into more of the fine art and I started working in portraits mm -hmm. for friends and their kids. So I doing pastels. Um, I think I, uh, I also had worked in, I'm trying to think of when I was working in watercolor. Right after I missed, there's, so there's a phase I missed here in my discussion to pastel. Okay. But I went from markers into watercolor, which is an easier transition. So you're working in line and then you work transparently layering over color over color and learn to save your lights. Just as in markers, you, can, you can't go back to the white of the paper. So when I found pastel, I was an immediate affinity because now you have uh, room to 
go back and forth. You're working darks to light. Um, it was so much more free. I was happy to put the watercolors, which are tricky and, you know, yeah. there, it's a, you, you have to paint loosely and free yet. Don't make a mistake. You know, it's like yeah. a hard thing to do. You got to keep practicing it in pastel. You could scrape it off and you could work back. So that was my first, you okay. know, style of painting into pastel. And then I went into oil after that so that I could work larger and not have to worry about framing under glass. Uh huh. So I basically worked pastel and um, started doing the portraiture. Then I went to landscapes and then I started, I found some galleries. So now I'm more of a fine artist and I always felt that as long as I could sell paintings and I'm just going to stay in this uh, genre not go back to, you know, my husband kept asking me when I was going back to work. <laughs> oh, because, like, yeah, because it's like, is that work? Because you're just doing what you love, but you're still making money out of it, right? right. Or were you not right. at the time? No, I, I started selling paintings and I started getting into galleries uh -huh. and I started winning awards and I was slowly, and I felt the more you win the awards, how? you start to how, how do you do that? Like how people would like, I mean, I would love to know, how do you, okay, you have years of experience, So this is, I don't know what year we are right now, but you're 30 something and you have right. years of experience because you've been drawing and painting and learning new mediums for all your life. How do you, how do you start selling paintings? Like where do you go to sell paintings? How, how you, how do you create that? And how do you get awards? How, because you have a bunch of awards. I was looking at your website and I was, oh my God, like I want to be here. So how do you get all that? There, you know, it's again, But, you know, when you start taking classes and meeting people, I could always find someone as a mentor. I would look up to them and how are they doing it? And um, so as a fine artist for the kind of work, you know, I still had an illustrative style. I didn't even know what I was going to say with my art. I just wanted to start painting and doing the portraits for, you know. So I was developing, but I'm, I'm home full time with my kids now. So from the time I'm in my early 30s to 40, let's say 10 years, They're now 10 and 12 when I, mm -hmm. when I got my first studio away from home mm -hmm. so I could separate and now feel like a real artist because at home, you know, you're, it's tricky. Um, there's, uh, especially in pastels, there's different shows you enter. And when you get accepted, then you start building your, um, like your uh, resume by the awards you earn. And it's one way to get recognition. So you enter shows and you don't get in them and then you enter shows. So you keep doing the work and... I feel because of my skill in drawing from all those years, I kind of got, um, it was successful early on because I already had that background and mm -hmm. uh, foundation of drawing. And then I started painting in um, pastel. I also won a few awards in watercolor too, so it was back and forth. Um, and then from that point, when you get in galleries and you sell your work, my work is, you know, pleasant. People bought it. I was happy about, you know, my your subject. Your beautiful. Uh, And I really did, I, I thought I was going to be a portrait painter for a while really? when I was doing kids because I, I love faces, but, and doing children was fine because they grew up and now they're remembered by the portrait I did. People don't realize that whether it would look like them or not. And parents were always so happy. I never wanted to do the um, adult portraits because no one's ever happy with their portraits. Oh, that's such a good point. Oh my God. It's so true. People oh love the portraits of their kids. They're so happy. The kids grow up and they remember them. As these yeah. And when you're an adult, you just see your flaws. I'm like, oh, my nose is too big and my ears are too long or whatever. And kids don't see that. Kids just, right. oh, man, this is so true. Well, I, you know, sometimes I think I'll go back to it. I don't know. I'm kind of in a flux state right now. But I don't want to, you know, I like to do too many things and get distracted by trying out all this different stuff. Mm -hmm. Um So when you get in a gallery, you start selling your work, and then you keep going. And uh, I've been in galleries very successfully, and then the gallery would close for whatever reason, not my fault. Uh, I've sold on my own. When I got my own studio, I would sell out of my studio. So you slowly build, but I was also able to still be full-time parent, so I feel like the compromise worked really well, and I was still painting and drawing. Um, I might have thought to go back into illustration, It's just changed so much, and everybody's working on the computer, and it's so f much faster. Uh, I did illustrate two children's books a couple of years ago, which I was had always wanted to do, and I did it in watercolor. Um, but it's really hard. It's really hard and time-consuming, and yeah. you don't know. Um, it takes like a year of your time 
And um, yeah. maybe someday when I don't want to be hauling my big paintings around, <laughs> we'll see. So um, I think the hardest part, should I get to that point, the hardest part of the biggest yeah. challenge? Please, please, um, yeah. Was, it was the parenting and how to figure out, how to find out what to do um, with the time. And I said, because I was a night owl, I could live. I mean, I got my sleep. It was just, you know, I, I slept five to six hours and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Now the research says that really isn't good. I need to get more sleep. But so <laughs> far, so far I got away with it. You know, um, maybe my memory, I'll have problems when I get older because I was lack of sleep, but, um, but that was my normal sleep. I mean, I don't sleep a lot or five wow. to six hours was fine. Most of my, and I didn't want to, you know, I'd love to go into my studio at night and have my own time. And I think that's helped balance whatever happens during the day. I was fine being with my kids, um, playing with my kids because, you know, that's enjoyable. And then I would work at night. My husband would be home. Mm -hmm. And after dinner, I'd go upstairs and he'd watch TV with that. What well, They would do their thing. And then um, I would go to bed and listen to music. It was fun to stay, you know. Wow. I think nighttime is very enjoyable. No interruptions. Nobody was going to call. There was nothing else to do. It was very much, this is all I can do and I like what I'm doing. I'm yeah. working more day now and I'm not as focused. Yeah, because yeah, there's people call or you remember right. something, but people are maybe I should be going to the store, maybe I should be doing this, you know, where at night, you know, I don't need to watch TV, I'd rather be painting, so. Exactly. Same yeah. thing as uh, holidays, you know, nothing happens on holidays, so it's a great day to work as well. Right, yeah, especially now, probably. Oh my God, yeah, especially with the, with the pandemic, well, right. everything changed. Uh, Art-wise, though, what was your biggest challenge? I mean, you mastered so many different mediums over the years. And I know you're a teacher as well. Right, that so. came later, but yeah, that's, that's made a big impact. The teaching, um, you don't get as much painting done. So now mm -hmm. I'm in, now that the teaching just stopped oh, because yeah. of the pandemic, I either choose and I, I will, I'd love, I want to keep my current students. They're local students in Chicago that have been with me a number of years, but I'm going to have to figure out how to be online. And I know I can, but all that time it's spent new. there. Should I set that aside and start painting more? Because it got to be a balance of how much time for painting, how much time for teaching. Mm -hmm. And I really love teaching. It's fun to be with a tribe of people who want to hear what you have to say. Uh, I have a funny story about that. My daughter did go to uh, RISD. Uh, she got to have the education I always wanted because back in my day, all the major illustrator award winners were from Rhode Island School of Design. And... Um, so I'd go visit her and I'd start talking and art and then your daughter, she'd just roll her eyes, mom. And I realized, boy, do I have a lot to say. So I'm gonna find some students who wanna hear what I have to say because my daughter, you know, it's a daughter thing. <laughs> this is mom talking, so she doesn't, it's just, we have a great relationship and she's older now. Now she wants to hear about how to do your own framing and how to, <laughs> how to save money doing this and that. How old but is she now? She's 35. 35 and she yeah. is and my our grandson and she's doing she's doing a really cool thing um she listens to podcasts how people do this but she has her son in her studio with her mm. he has a mess now she's more abstract and more um she's definitely more abstract and I always had a specific um I didn't want to be interrupted while I work mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with because I can't make a mistake I've got certain you know my my style is realistic so I need to pay attention and um, she's more like let things flow and so Milo's in her room and you know he's doing his thing now I know she also has time to work alone but I've apologized to her I, I you know as she turns into an artist anyway I'm sorry I didn't bring you in my studio I mean, they certainly had all the art supplies they wanted to play with but my space was sacred you know yeah. I'm there now like I used to set an alarm when they were coming home from school 15 minutes earlier just to get out of my head and oh, get ready. That that's was, smart. That, it was. I mean, it was like the bus is, you know, coming. The alarm would go off. Okay, I got to get ready. They're coming in so that I'd be receptive to having them that's come up to the studio. Yeah. That's great and I, I had the batteries and the alarm for a number of years after they grew up. I would still hear the alarm. <laughs> it was kind of sweet to remember. <laughs> oh, yeah, the kids were coming home. And there's no kids there now. So, oh. yeah, it was kind of a remembrance um 
So the biggest challenge is getting into galleries, is selling your work when you're doing your work for yourself. Um, my daughter was an illustration major and she didn't want to do uh, work for other people. It's hard to do commissions or uh, work for hire, even though I always enjoy that I had the skills to be paid for the uh, what I could do with my hands because I never had any expectations. So I was, I, I'm so happy with whatever has happened to me. But now I would like to just do the work that I do. And um, sometimes I'll take a commission, but it's really hard now because I am used to doing whatever I want. Yeah. I'm, paint, I'm painting landscapes now and I feel like I would just rather paint landscapes and the uh, Chicago scenes, living mm -hmm. in Chicago and I'm a sailor. Um, so I love painting water and boats and that's all turned out really well too because of uh, the scenes that we have in the city. So it's been, I've been very fortunate to be successful with the work that I want to paint. People seem to want to buy it. Yeah. And it's better. You know, that is the tricky part is how to sell your work and um, figure that out. But look at the galleries that have the work that's similar to yours. That's one technique. Um, okay. Um, I, yeah, I suppose I should have some concrete examples of how to do this. Um, do the work you love, um, and you'll get that will obviously be more successful for you if you love what you're doing. And mm -hmm. then find the work, you know, in a galleries that's similar, not like yours, but that they're attracted to that type of work. Like my sailing scenes, it's perfect for Chicago. And now I'm in uh, Indiana and Michigan, and there's galleries here that do that or um, are receptive to my uh, work and style. Mm -hmm. Um, it takes a lot of time. It's in, you know, you're in business for yourself. First you have to make the work, then you have to frame the work, then you have to, you know, photograph it and enter the shows. And so it's, it's a, a whole business. project. It's a whole project. And I think, you know, I wish schools would set up their students better because you're going to be, a uh, in your own business for most of your life. And they don't mm -hmm. tell you anything about how to run a business. And, you know, there's marketing. I could be better at marketing. I, uh, um, yeah, you can't be great at everything. Well, you can't. Is that what you said? You can't. Yeah, you can't. It's just you're you're so good at so many things. I mean, your paintings are mind blowing, seriously. And that's oh. and I'm I'm glad. Again, you're one of the ten artists that we have in our book and we were in awe when you saw your paintings of Chicago and the way you capture light and shadow specifically is what really gave me pause. Your work is gorgeous. And uh, and th no, thank you for being in our book. Because um, yeah, if if, and if uh, you guys want to hear more about the book, just head out to etrelab.com forward slash book, and we will have more information about it there. Uh, it's my honor to be in your book, and then being in a book also um, helps your career. Like anytime you can, you put out a, um, you know, people. That's like with the shows when there's. You can build your reputation through shows. You can make sales through shows. People, mm -hmm. You need to get your work out somehow. So if nothing else, just raise your work to a level so that you do get in shows. Mm -hmm. The more you paint, the better you get. And then at that point, you'll start to realize that your work has value. What's really hard is people start to paint, and they paint for a year, and then they feel pretty good, and they think they're going to sell their work. And it's like, you're not going to listen to a violinist who's only been playing for a year. It, I really, as a teacher, I relate art to any type of practice for muscle memory. What you're developing is muscle memory. Uh -huh. And, you know, Michael Jordan shooting baskets, how many thousands and thousands. And so it's no secret. There's no magic uh, remedy. There's no, uh, just do it. It's a full-time job. 10,000 hours, it's up to a 20 year career or something like that, or, or five miles of canvas. Like one of my friends was a teacher, come and see me after you painted 500 canvases and we'll start to talk. Oh my goodness. And even so if they're little, that's why, you know, it's that thinking of practice. Um, you can't help but get better. And then as you learn these tools, then you can start doing something with them. My question for you though is sure, that you, we need the 10,000 hour rule, but it, there's a difference between focus 10,000 hours where you're practicing consciously and you know what you're doing and getting better at, but then you also have the other side of the coin, which are people who they spend the hours, but they're not seeing a lot of improvement because they're probably not working on the right things. And maybe this is where a mentor 
comes in very handy because you did not learn a new medium by the you know holy like out of the blue you 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 made a conscious decision to take classes to learn for someone who could teach you how to do it and i think that's very important would you mind speaking a little bit about that okay so i didn't have a professional or i didn't have a um, university experience or a, a degree mm -hmm. uh, what i found is what i needed so when i went to the american academy i saw that i spend this amount of money for this kind of school and I'm going to get a portfolio when I get out of here so that I can get a job. And then as I was working, I was practicing. So then when I wanted to get into the fine art world, I took a class uh, from a teacher in pastel and I, that's, I discovered pastel with a natural affinity. I just love the medium because of its tactile sense of drawing and color. And um, I just started to work with that and then I found Albert Handel who was a master in his field at the time. There were not that many pastel artists. Sally Strand um, is another pastel artist that I worked with. Um, and when I did oil painting, I wanted to branch into oil because of um, painting larger, you don't you have to frame under glass. That's mm -hmm. the only drawback to pastel with me is it has to be under glass. And so now you've got this issue with that. But um, Ken Oster was a great painter in California, he's gone now, but I learned a lot from him about oils and, and then also loosening up, you know, and so finding your own way. You can find a teacher that you love their work, but the methods they use are hard for you. So you just yeah. have to keep looking and finding. And even when my daughter went to RISD, I looked at who the teachers were. It doesn't matter where you go to school. You should find the teachers who, the work you admire, especially now, there's so many independent instructors. Just go find them. If they don't teach, copy their work. It's another thing I think is hugely valuable. You're not going to sell it, but you're going to copy or copy the masters. You can't go wrong, you know, with Degas or Monet or the people you admire. I always ask my students to show me the work you admire so I can help you get to that direction. I don't want right. you to paint like me, but if you paint enough um, still lifes in the style of, of work that you love, then set up your own still life after a few of those, and now you can see what happens, what's come through you. And to paint small, because then you can get through a lot more paintings, you have to resolve them. When people start painting larger, by the time they get finished, you know, um, they might have lost their way or they spent mm -hmm. too much time. Do small studies over and over and over. I think the real, and this information is out there, especially with the urban sketchers, sketch every day. Yeah. That's practice. And you don't have to make it all um, a finished painting. It's really the practice of your hand on the paper moving around and just keep doing it. And even some days with more focus, some days just for fun. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, there's so many different things. Different any, ways to thank you. Before we go, any last words you want to leave to our listeners? Any advice? Well, just again, on that same note of practice, uh, it's easy to say and harder to do. You, just, you know whether you're doing it or not. And if you do small sketches and Drawing from life, uh, I, I started to develop this new direction in teaching, which was meditative mindfulness in mm -hmm. sketching, where you uh, put your pen on the paper, you don't lift it, you look at the object, you, it's, it's called like blind contour and no one wants to do it, but it really will um, stop, you with, stop you from getting into all the analysis. Is this going to be good? Is this going to turn out? We know it's not going to turn out. Just put your pen on the paper and practice the observational skill of um, following what your eyes are seeing mm -hmm. with your pen on paper. And if you keep doing that, um, once you do it, it's very meditative. It's very calming. It's very you start to feel um, connected to something, and it's really it's like being here in the moment. Wow. It's a really good way to set you into that you know state of, you. of observation and. I'll try that. I want, I, I'm going to try that. Thanks. Or just draw spirals for a while. I mean, honestly, keeping your hand moving will get you started and then you'll go on from there. So that's my favorite thing to say. <laughs> Community college, prestigious art schools, online classes, online research. Today, is, it's just so easy to find information. I mean, there's so much, it actually becomes overwhelming quite easily. What are your favorite ways of learning? Please let us know in the comment section associated with this post at etcherlab.com forward slash Kathleen. 
That's E-T-C-H-R-L-A-B dot com forward slash K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N. Like the podcast? Help us support the show by subscribing and giving us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts at etrelab.com forward slash go forward slash apple. See you in the next episode and until then, let's make more art. <laughs>